Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Chapter 2 Sunday night supper is whatever's left from noon. If nothing's left over, Mom, Ma takes cold cornmeal mush, fries up big slabs, and we eat it with caro syrup. But this night, there's still rabbit. I don't want any, but I know Shiloh does. I wonder how long I can keep pushing that piece of rabbit around my plate. Not very long, I discover. You gonna eat that meat, or are you just playing with it? Dad asks. If you don't want it, I'll take it for lunch tomorrow. I'll eat it, I say. Don't you be giving it to that dog, says Ma. I take a tiny bite. What's the doggy gonna eat then? Asks Becky. She's three, which is four years younger than Dara Lynn. Nothing here, that's what, says Ma. Becky and Dara Lynn look at Dad. Now I had them feeling sorry for the beagle too. Sometimes girl children get what they want easier than I do, but not this time. Dog's going right back across the river when we get through eating, says Dad. If that's Judd's new dog, he probably won't have, or he probably don't have sense enough yet to find his way home again. We'll put him in the Jeep and drive him over. Don't know what else I figured Dad to say. Do I really think he's going to tell me to wait till morning, and if the beagle's still here, we can keep him? I try all kinds of ways to figure out how I could get that rabbit meat off my plate and into my pocket, but Ma's watching every move I make. So I excuse myself and go outside and over to the, ki the chicken coop. It's off toward the back, where Ma can't see. We keep three hens, and I take one of the two eggs that was in a nest and carry it out behind the bushes. I whistle softly. Shiloh comes loping towards me. I crack the egg and empty it out in my hands. Hold my hands down low and Shiloh eats the egg, licking my hands clean afterward, then curling his tongue down between my fingers to get every little bit. Good boy, Shiloh, I whisper and stroke him all over. I hear the back screen slam and Dad comes out on the stoop. Marty? Yeah? I go around, Shiloh at my heels. Let's take that dog home now. Dad goes over and opens the door of the jeep. Shiloh puts his tail between his legs and just stands there, so I go around to the other side, get in, and whistle. Shiloh leaps up onto my lap, but he don't look too happy about it. For the first time, I have my arms around him. He feels warm, and when I stroke him, I can feel places on his body where he has ticks. Dog has ticks, I tell my dad. Judd'll take him off, Dad says. What if he don't? That's his concern, Marty, not yours. It's not your dog. You keep to your own business. I press myself against the back of the seat as we start down our bumpy dirt driveway down the road. Towards the road. I want to be a vet someday, I tell my dad. Hmm, he says. I want to be a traveling vet. The kind that has his office in a van and goes around to people's homes. Don't make folks come to him. Read about it in a magazine at school. You know what you have to do to be a vet? Dad asks. Got to go to school, I know that. You've got to have college training, like a doctor, almost. Takes a lot of money to go to veterinary school. My dream sort of leaks out like water in a paper bag. I could be a veterinarian's helper, I suggest, my second choice. You maybe could, says Dad, and points the jeep up the road into the hills. Dusk is settling in now. Still warm, though. A warm July night. Trees look dark against the red sky. Lights coming on in a house here, another one there. I'm thinking how in any one of these houses there's probably somebody who would take better care of Shiloh than Judd Travers would. How come this dog had to be his? The reason I don't like Judd Travers is a whole lot of reasons. Not the least is that I was in a corner store, store once down in Friendly and saw Judd cheat Mr. Wallace at the cash register. Judd gives the man a 10 and gets him to talking, then when Mr. Wallace gives him change, says he gave him a 20. I blink, like I can't believe Judd done that, and old Mr. Wallace is all confused. So I say, no, I think he give you a 10. Judd glares at me, whips out his wallet, and waves a $20 bill in front of my eye. 
Whose picture is on this bill, boy? He says, I don't know. He gives me a look, says, I thought so. That's Andrew Jackson, he says. I had two of them in my wallet when I walked in here, and now I only got one. This here man's got the other, and I want my change. Mr. Wallace, he's so flustered he just digs in his money drawer and gives Judd change for a twenty. And afterward, I thought, what did Andrew Jackson have to do with it? Judd's so fast talking, he can get away with anything. Don't know anybody who likes him much, but around here, folks keep to their own business, like Dad says. In Tyler County, that's important. Way it's always been, anyhow. Another reason I don't like Judge Jed Travers is he spits tobacco out the corner of his mouth, and he and if he don't like you, and he sure don't like me, he sees just how close he can spit to where you're standing. Third reason I don't like him is because he was at the fairgrounds last year, same day we were, and seemed like every place he was, or I was, he was in front of me, blocking my view. Standing in front of me at the mud bog, sitting in front of me at the tractor pull, and rising right up out of his seat at the Jordan Glove of Death Motorcycle Act, so I miss the best part. Fourth reason I don't like him is because he kills deer out of season. He says he don't, but I seen him once just about dusk with a young buck strapped over the hood of his trunk. He tells me the, bunk, the buck ran in front of him on the road and he accidentally ran over it, but I saw the bullet hole myself. If he got caught, he'd have to pay $200, more than he's got in the bank, I bet. I bet. We're in Shiloh now. Dad's crossing the bridge up by, sorry, Dad's crossing the bridge by the old abandoned gristmill, turning at the boarded up school. And for the first time, I can feel Shiloh's body begin to shake. He's trembling all over. I swallow, try to say something to my dad and have to swallow again. How do you go about reporting someone who don't care or don't take care of his dog right? I ask finally. Who are you fixing to report, Marty? Judd. If this dog's mistreated, he's only about one out of the 50,000 animals that is, Dad says. Folks even bring him up here in the woods and let him out, figure they can live on rats and rabbits. Wouldn't be the first dog that wasn't treated right. But this one come to me to help him, I insist. Knew that's why he was following me. I got hooked on him, Dad, and I want to know he's treated right. For the first time, I can tell Dad's getting impatient with me. Now you get that out of your head right now. If it's Travers' dog, it's no mind of your or of ours how he treats it. What if it was a child? I ask him, getting too smart for my own good. What if some kid was shaking like this dog is shaking? You wouldn't feel no pull for keeping an eye on him. Marty, Dad says, and now his voice is just plum tired. This here's a dog, not a child, and it's not our dog. I want you to quit going about it. Here? I shut up then. Let my hands run over Shiloh's body like maybe everywhere I touch I can protect him somehow. We're getting closer to the trailer where Judd lives with his other dogs, and already they're barking up a storm, hearing Dad's jeep come up the road. Dad pulls over. You want to let him out? He says. I shake my head hard. I'm not letting him out here till I know for sure he belongs to Judd. I'm asking for a slap in the face, but Dad don't say anything. Just gets out and goes up the boards Judd has laid out in place of the sidewalk. Judd's at the door of his trailer already, in his undershirt, peering out. Looks like Ray Preston, he says through the screen. How you doing, Judd? Judd comes out on the little porch he's built at the side of his trailer, and they stand there and talk a while. Up here in the hills, you hardly ever get down to business right off. First, you say your howdies, and then you talk about anything else but what you come for, and finally, when the mosquitoes start to bite, you say what's on your mind, but you always edge into it, not to offend. I can hear little bits and pieces floating out over the yard, the rain, the truck, the tomatoes, the price of gasoline, and all the while Shiloh lays low in my lap, tail between his legs, shaking like a window blind in a breeze. And then the awful words. Say, Judd, my boy was up here along the river this afternoon and a beagle followed him home. Don't have any tags on his collar, 
but I'm remembering you got yourself another hunting dog and wondered if he might be yours. I'm thinking, this is a bad mistake. Maybe it isn't Judd's at all, and he's such a liar he'd say it was just to get himself still another animal to be mean to. Judd hardly lets him finish, starts off across the muddy yard in his boots. Sure as hell bet it is, he says. Can't keep that coon dog home to save my soul. Every time I take him hunting, he runs off before I'm through. I've been out all day with the dogs, and they all come back but him. I can hear Judd's heavy footsteps coming around the side of the jeep, and I can smell his chewing tobacco, strong as coffee. Yep, he says, thrusting his face in the open window. That's him, all right. He opens the door. Get on down here, he says. And before I can even give the dog one last pat, Shiloh leaps off my lap onto the ground and connects with Judd's right foot. He yelps and runs off behind the trailer, tail tucked down, belly to the ground. All Judd's dogs, chained out back, bark like crazy. I jump out of the jeep, too. Please don't kick him like that, I say. Some dogs just like to run. He runs all over creation, Judd says. I can tell he's studying me in the dark, trying to figure what's it to me. I'll keep an eye out for him, I say. Anytime I see him away from home, I'll bring him back. I promise. Just don't kick him. Judd only growls. He could be a fine hunting dog, but he tries my patience. I'll leave him be tonight, but he wanders off again, I'll whoop the daylights out of him. Guarantee you that. I swallow and swallow, and all the way home I can't speak a word, trying to hold the tears back.